frequently put forward and certainly has been kind of the traditional view uh, among uh, most Americans is that 1776 is uh, the true founding and the true center uh, of the American experience. So here we are in the midst of this moment uh, and uh, we will explore uh, these, uh, these reports, the uh, 1619 project and the report from the 1776 commission. But uh, what I really uh, hope we uh, focus on even more are, are just these concepts, these, these notions of um, you know, what, the, what the real founding is and what really was the role of, of, uh, of slavery, race in, in, the, uh, in the founding. How does that fit into our, our concepts? Uh, how should we think about these, uh, you could say, sort of uh, archetypes of um, uh, different uh, poles of what the American experience is? Uh, so I'm going to start with a pretty broad uh, question for, uh, for our panelists, for each and all. Um, and I think it's an appropriate uh, place to start, and that is, why are we here? Why, I, I presume uh, that, uh, that you all think that this is an important question, but why is it an important question? Uh, why is it important to grapple with this issue, and what are the stakes? Well, I suppose I might start, because I am representing the, the earlier period that we're talking about here. And let me first start by thanking Andy for inviting us to do this. Thanks, all of you, for coming. Thanks to the staff at the ATH for serving us dinner soon. Um, and I think that there's a number of reasons why this is important. I think um, history matters in terms of how we understand ourselves, in terms of how we make sense of the world around us. And so debating these questions is really fundamental to how we place ourselves in our own present. And so I think to get to sort of why 1619 is an important um, moment for us to reflect on as a nation, as something in kind of opposition to 1776, is that um, I would maybe push back a little bit on what you said, Andy, and that I don't think that the 1619 Project is trying to say so much that racism is at the founding of the United States, but that slavery is a fundamental part of the foundation of the colonial system which turned into the United States, and that the slavery that came out, or that the racism that came out of slavery um, continues in institutionalized form up to the present day. And I think what is important for um, a lot of us to understand about 1619 is that uh, the, the narratives I think a lot of us were raised on were kind of the Mayflower in 1620 and that there's this sort of rise, exponential rise towards freedom up to 1776. And I think by highlighting the year before that, that we have enslaved Africans being sold in Virginia um, and that this becomes part of the plantation system which was a dominant part of the economy, certainly of the South, but of the entirety of the United States. Uh, and that that continues on to have repercussions not only into the 18th century, but the 19th, and then after slavery is abolished, uh, the sort of racism and the institutions that are founded from that continue into the 20 and the 21st century. Um, and so I think that that legacy is, is really, really central. And in my mind, um, 1776 is going to be kind of a confusing moment of foundation if you don't understand the 150 years that precede it. And I think the confusion that oftentimes people have about the Declaration of Independence comes about because we simply don't think about that much longer history that preceded that particular moment in time. So I think the stakes are really how do we understand our current moment and how do we make sense of a really complicated history that this nation has. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Me? <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> um, Yes, thanks again, uh, uh, Andy. Well, the, uh, I mean, the contemporary uh, issues uh, over race are um, important and they're, um, uh, you know, th this is a fault in America that is active. Um, you know, here in California, we distinguish between active faults and inactive faults, <coughs> which, or ones we thought were inactive. Um, and this is a very active uh, fault in America right now. Uh, because it's involved with a whole series of issues which are um, controversial between the two political parties and which involve uh, more generally a kind of judgment about ourselves. What is America and what should we think of America? How should we think about America? Is it, uh, is it something to, is America something that um, deserves our loyalty? 
that represents principles which um, um, are worthy of our respect um, or, or not? Um, or is America uh, a much um, um, more, uh, a much uh, less noble and, uh, and um, admirable place? Uh, in, in which case, of course, that leads to a whole series of other questions about what would be better or how could one make America different and presumably uh, better. So the, the issues of our politics turn, in a way, on these questions which might at one time have been dismissed simply as cultural or intellectual, but which go very deep, actually, into the fault lines between the parties and between the politics that we're going to, we have seen in 20. 16 and 2020, and believe me, I, I, I can predict safely we will see again in 2024. Uh, and that makes it very important. Uh, besides that, there is the question of what is true in and of itself from an academic uh, point of view, from a philosophical point of view, from a historical point of view. And those two questions, I think, are, in this case, entangled and deeply uh, related to one another. They're not exactly the same, but they are very close in, our, in this moment. Okay. Sure. Yeah, um, so from my perspective, I guess I'm supposed to provide the perspective of uh, the civil rights era. Um, these uh, two projects, I feel, are important conversations to have um, because I think it reflects uh, the complexities, as Dan said. Uh, of American history, and if we don't necessarily understand uh, the motivation for these two projects, it's difficult to grapple with our contemporary concerns and, and, and issues that we face within our society, particularly, as Charles says, uh, issues surrounding politics and so forth. Um, but for me, I think this uh, conversation is important as well because it reflects that we're at a point in US history where we can have this conversation and have a debate about it. And I think that reflects progress in my mind. Um, but most importantly, I think it also reflects the importance of having multiple stories or multiple ev entry points in which we can think about US history um, and understand those entry points may be meaningful to me in a different way than it may be uh, meaningful to you. And um, I think these entry points into US history allows us to see ourselves in that history um, and also allows us to see others within that history. Okay, thank you. Um, so Dan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you for a minute as a historian. Uh, what, what do you see as the, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of the 1619 Project's portrayal? Uh, and why, I mean, it, both of these, 1619 and the 1776 report, uh, have come under significant criticism by different historians. Why is that and do, how justified do you think some of those criticisms have been? Sure, well I think the uh, the strength of the 1619 Project to, to build up what something that Professor Mills was saying is that I think that it causes, um, well, well one, it just introduces more people into the history of America that typically don't get represented in that story. And so if, if the story is really just about kind of what a certain group of political leaders did at one moment in time, it really, I think, um, prevents a lot of people from connecting in a personal way with that story and to realize there's a much larger kind of demographic experience that doesn't get captured by just focusing on a sort of narrow band of political history. And I think the 1619 Project, um, I, I would say it, its chief contributions were to show how these ideas that many of us would call structural racism that we believe still have a deep impact in American society today, um, how those structures were founded um, at the very beginning of colonization in the Americas, um, and how they progressed towards uh, many of the issues that I think we're facing as a society today uh, around issues of race. I would also say that um, one of the things that doesn't really get talked about much with the 1619 Project is I think it actually has a very, um, positive, hopeful tone to it. Sometimes people don't see it that way. Um, but it, it really ends, and I, I think even it's, it's sort of framed really around the idea that um, if you want to find kind of the, the purest expression of freedom in the United States, it really is in the struggle that African Americans have had to endure coming from slavery 
into freedom and still trying to build upon those concepts of freedom. And so I think that's a really um, spectacular contribution that doesn't really get talked about that much. And I think a lot of times the emphasis in 1776 is about trying to kind of make us feel more positive about our history. And I think that there's nothing wrong with trying to feel positive about your own nation's history, but it should be done with a sort of sober look at what that history actually is. In terms of the critiques, I think certainly some people would just say, well, this is talking about all the bad stuff. The United States is not the only place that had slavery, and of course that's true. It happened all over the world. Um, the one thing we can get into, maybe this is better for the question and answer session because it's a complicated question, but one of the, the flashpoints for historians was a one sentence note in the 1619 Project, which is from the introduction from Nic Nicole Hannah-Jones, it said, uh, the American Revolution was fought to protect slavery. And that created a tremendous amount of um, debate, especially among historians. And I might save, we can talk about that later, we can talk about it now, however you want to, but um, that is a contention that I think we can debate. Um, I would say for myself, do I think that slavery was the main reason why people rebelled against Britain? I don't think so. Do I think it's a reason that some people did? Absolutely. And I think that that is something that we should probably talk about at some point. I think there's a lot that we could sort of address with that. And it helps to explain in some ways um, sort of what the Declaration of Independence was, was trying to do. So I would say those are sort of the, the, the chief objections and, and maybe the strengths of the project. Okay. Uh, would anyone else want to jump in and compliment that? Sure. Um, well, I would say it's, um, uh, in certain respects, very tendentious history and uh, a simplification um, of, a, uh, of, a, of a complicated story uh, and that it was, in fact, criticized by many of the most prominent professional historians in the country, historians of the founding period, historians of the Civil War, of Lincoln, and others uh, for uh, uh, telling one side of a multifaceted uh, story. And all of these historians are impeccable political liberals. This is not a case of, of um, conservatives uh, ganging up on liberals. Uh, it's a case of um, liberals objecting to a New York Times certified uh, account of history, although they've somewhat backed off the notion that it is history towards the notion that it's journalism that, in, that ought to inform history, but not maybe history. But I would say uh, no one would want to go back to the state of American historiography in the 1920s on the question of the revolution and slavery. This is, we've had f amazing um, historians and, and, uh, and historiography in, in the intervening decades, and it has in a way, uh, you know, it sort of accelerated in the 60s um, and even the 70s. And we understand a lot of things much better than Americans did in the 1920s about the revolution, about the role of slavery in America. Uh, and all of that has, has been extremely useful and, uh, and revealing, I think. But it doesn't, um, uh, th nothing, so to speak, new has really, uh, was in announced in the uh, 1619 project. It, were, it was really an interpretive um, essay or series of essays designed to argue uh, that 1619 was somehow the true beginning of the country, uh, which is, as I say, uh, a very uh, odd reading <laughs> of American history. Now, one could say, and it would have been better to say this in defense of 1619, it was all, 1619, I believe, was also the year that the first meeting of the Virginia House of Burgesses occurred. And so one could say it would have been, from my view, truer and better to say that 1619 is, the, is in some ways the beginning of representative government in the country and the beginning of the presence of chattel slavery. I mean, I think that the paradox is better than simply going with slavery as the essence of uh, American history and of the meaning of, uh, of the country. Um, but they didn't do that. 
Okay. Um, tr if you want, try. If you oh, want I was to just going to add uh, something that was uh, touched upon. Um, my reading of Nicole Hannah Jones um, connecting the, the issue of slavery with the American Revolution was more in line with the idea that the economic prosperity that came from the institution of slavery um, gave the founders the idea that you know they could sustain themselves independently from the British call, um, uh, British Empire, and so it wasn't so much that they were fighting to protect slavery. At least the way I was reading Nicole Hannah Jones's um, essay or or sixteen nineteen project. I don't know if that's an important point to make. Okay. Um, all right. So. I'm going to move uh, quickly to the uh, 1776 Advisory Commission, uh, Charles. So I'm going to ask you the same thing about that that I asked Dan about the um, 1619 project. That is, uh, it issued a report. What are the strengths and the weaknesses of the 1776 Commission's response to the 1619 project? And why has it come under criticism, and how justified are those criticisms? Well, um, the 1776 report was produced in, a, in about a month, or somewhere between two weeks and four weeks as the Trump administration was expiring. Uh, and so it was a rush project, and it shows it. Uh, it it's, in my view, at least very imperfect. Um, it, um, although it was, uh, in some ways the most efficient government report ever produced by a government commission. Uh, it, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, rapidity with which it was produced shows, I think. It's, uh, it's a little bit um, um, tendentious in its own way. I mean, it, it takes the, you might say, the colorblind reading of the Declaration of Independence and of American principles and runs with it, um, but it's uh, the weakness of the seven, uh, in my view, of the 1776 report is that it sometimes speaks as though the South were not part of America, you know, and a part of American history, um, and uh, of course it was, and you know, so it's it 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 condemns essentially slavery and the South as contrary to the. Declaration of Independence, which is is uh, fine as far as it goes, and I don't object to that reading. But as a um, as an account of American of America after 1776, it it's um, selective in the sense that it uh, it it treats the South as though it were an alien part of American civilization rather than an integral part of the actual nation that emerged from 1776 and 1787. Okay, any additional thoughts on that, Dan? Try. Um, I guess one of the critiques uh, of the 1776 project that um, I wrestle with uh, personally in from an academic perspective as well, is that it oftentimes, at least my reading of the report and uh, just listening to conversations of uh, advocators of the 1776 project, it oftentimes uh, fails to allow um, the narratives of others um, uh, that's not Eurocentric or that's not US centric um, to um, fail to allow those narratives to be a part of the conversation. And I think that's one of my main critique of the 1776 project. But at the same time, I think, as I said at the beginning, you know, having this uh, narrative or recognition of the importance of the 1776, um, not necessarily the project, but the year, uh, I think has already been established within US history and within our educational system. I think most of us are familiar with the importance of this particular year. 
and um, how that shaped not only U.S. history, but world history. And so sometimes I, I wonder about uh, whether it's necessary to have this project, you know, to reinforce or embolden uh, what's already been the norm or the accepted standard within our U.S. history and our educational system. Um, I would just say that I, I, to try to, to to try to be generous to some extent to the 1776 report. Um, I I understand the impulse to want to tell a positive story, to have people connect with their history, to have people um, feel that there is something worth connecting to, to contribute to your country. And I think that's the sort of, to, to look at it in the most optimistic way, I think that's what that report was trying to do. But it's pretty terrible as a history, I have to be honest. It's just not historical in a way that has any kind of rigor whatsoever. There's no historians that contributed to it. Um, most of the second half is just essentially a condemnation of all things liberal or progressive. Um, I, I absolutely agree with Professor Kessler that it treats the South essentially as some sort of horrible force of regression in opposition to the Northern force of progression. And it's just a battle between these two forces and, and the good side won. It's a very simplistic way of thinking about history. And there's, I'll be honest, deeply offensive um, moments in that report that at one point say that sort of the identity politics of sort of social activists today um, owe their debt to John C. Calhoun, who was one of the most horrific figures in American history, supporter of slavery, uh, secessionist. Um, there's just some very, I would say, um, unfortunate and kind of damning attempts to try to score very cheap political points in it. Well, it, it was the Trump administration. <laughs> All right, so, uh, Troy, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, today's debate over the role of race and slavery in the founding, uh, as I've mentioned before, it could really be seen as uh, just the newest version of a long argument that's been going on, on and off. Uh, was there a version of this argument taking place within the civil rights movement um, let's say maybe between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, or uh, you know, any figures, any strands of that movement um, that were maybe carrying out a sort of s similar uh, discourse about w what is America? Is it is it something to um, admire and hope that it lives up to its principles, or is it kind of I irremediably tainted? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think. Um, if I think about uh, the discourse within the civil rights movement, I don't think necessarily that they were debating which particular time period is relevant to um, uh, US history, but they were referencing these various time periods uh, to uh, craft a rhetorical argument or, or um, justification for the rights and liberties that they were um, fighting for. Um, I can think of uh, Malcolm X and you know his reference to this idea that you know um, our ancestors weren't brought here by choice. Uh, you know Plymouth Rock landed on, on on them, so to speak, and that's in my in, in from my reading of it, anyways, his reference to the importance of the 1619 uh, uh, project, so to speak, or 16 the, the importance of 1619. And then I can see uh, Martin, Martin Luther King and his reference to 1776 and his famous I Have a Dream speech as a way to, um, and he, s he states that pretty specifically, that you know, I'm referencing these uh, values and ideals that we hold uh, dear within US society as a way to say that you know, we need to extend these values and ideals to, to all people and not necessarily those of European descent, right? So I don't think they were arguing about whether or not these two um, particular year or time period in US history is, is of importance or, in, or, or, or significance, but I think they were referencing it um, to craft the particular argument or positions that they were taking. Malcolm X was taking the posi position that, you know, it's important to for African Americans to recognize 
who they were before they came here. And um, uh, he was earlier in his career a separatist, uh, and he really believed that the only way people of African descent could achieve uh, a sense of dignity and uh, assert their humanity was to separate themselves from mainstream white society. Whereas uh, Martin Luther King you know, felt that the way forward is together, right? And if we can't cr craft a more perfect union with each other, then we're doomed to fail, right, as a society, so. Okay, uh, so here's a question for everyone. Uh, we're gonna move beyond, I think, the 1619 Project and 1776 Report and get, get into sort of the broader concept. But uh, what should we make of the Declaration of Independence, particularly its profession that all men are created equal? Uh, did they mean it? What did they do about it, if anything? And why didn't they do more about it? Well, that, that's in, in a way getting to the core of the issue, I think, because there are, um, you know, there are a couple of schools of thought um, about what they meant by all men are created equal. One, of, one school says that they meant by that uh, all white men are created, all white men of European descent, as Troy says, um, uh, were created equal and uh, they had no, gave no thought whatsoever to black men or any other or, or Indians or anyone else. Uh, another school of thought says uh, they meant more than that, but they didn't really know what they meant. Uh, and a third school of thought says uh, they were hypocrites. That is, they, they said all men are created equal. They meant, uh, they meant that to include all human beings and of whatever color, um, but they, they violated those beliefs uh, by maintaining the system uh, of slavery, and therefore they were, uh, one can say the first interpretation is they were racist, the third interpretation is they were hypocrites. Um, but there's also the, the possibility, which is where I think uh, um, I would end up, that they meant that all, they meant by all um, men are created equal, that all human beings are equally human beings. It's a self-evident truth, that is one in which the the predicate is contained already in the idea of the subject, to, to speak uh, philosophically. So who says, uh, all men already says created equal. Each is equally a man, equally human, a human being. Uh, all goldfish are created equal too. They're, each one is a goldfish, not anything else. And is equally a goldfish, even though some are small, some are large, some swim fast, some swim slow, and so forth. But what they are, their essence is the same, even though there are many secondary differences between them. I think that's the, th philosophically what they meant, and I think that's how they understood it, most of them at least. Um, that uh, means that slavery was wrong from this point of view. And the, one of the paradoxes of the founding and of the Declaration in particular is that the, the s those members of the uh, uh, Second Continental Congress that were adopting this statement, many were slaveholders, including Jefferson, including Washington, um, and uh, they were condemning themselves in the course, by the, by the very process of endorsing uh, this statement. Uh, and I, that actually, uh, I, there's a lot, I think there's a pretty overwhelming evidence that very few of them thought that slavery was anything other than wrong. The question was what to do about it, which is a, a very diff different and very difficult um, question from the point of view of the Second Continental Congress, uh, which is a, already involved in a war against Great Britain. Uh, you know, the war, the declaration was 1776, but the war began a year earlier in April 7. Uh, 1775. There were already British armies on American land. There were, you know, uh, there were uh, people being killed uh, and the people dying, uh, you know, in New England and elsewhere uh, as this war went on. 
And so they had to uh, win the war. That was the first priority um, in 1776. Uh, freeing the slaves, which they had no power to do. This was the con Second Continental Congress. This was a, essentially a diplomatic meeting designed to decide what to do vis-a-vis -vis the British um, and how to conduct a war against them. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of prudential reasons why Is that the rain? <laughs> no, that's the air conditioning, I hope. All right, anyway. Um, uh, the, uh, there are many prudential reasons why they didn't do anything about slavery uh, at the Second Continental Congress. But they did the most important thing possible, yeah, I would say, which is to condemn it morally and philosophically by implication. Um, and all of the efforts at abolition uh, after the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, you know, in the uh, 19th century, um, uh, in the radical Republicans, um, after the Civil War, um, trace themselves essentially back to the Declaration of Independence. And I don't think they were wrong in, in doing that. Well, I think a lot of people were not wanting to abolish slavery because they made a lot of money off of it. And that was a pretty major reason why they wanted to protect it through the Constitution, which absolutely protected slavery. Um, and I think that, um, you know, Jefferson is probably the person that stands in for this confusion because Jefferson certainly had these conflicted feelings about slavery. He wrote about it as sort of, what do we do? How can we get rid of this? Jefferson never, except for five people, two of whom were his sons, he, he didn't emancipate anyone else on his plantation. Um, he was dependent upon that. Um, and so despite, I, I would agree that yes, there's an aspirational quality to the Declaration of Independence, um, but there was not much effort put in place to do anything to spread those values to people who were not landed white men. Um, in terms of them not thinking about enslaved people, uh, that's not true in the Declaration of Independence. Um, look at the very final thing in the Declaration of Independence. If you know how it's structured, starts off with this kind of articulation of rights, then it goes into a list of grievances against the king. What's the very last thing? The king has incited domestic insurrections against us. That's a code for slave rebellions. And he's sick the merciless Indian savages against us. That is an indication that there is a deep sense of kind of racial animus that is, um, is feeling at least some of the, the attitudes towards this rebellion against the monarchy. So there was a thought about enslaved people, and it was simply that they were not going to be part of this new project, at least in those immediate years. The, the final thing to say kind of about slavery in this period is that um, slavery was not on a sort of downward trajectory from 1776 to 1865. Slavery was increasing in profitability and in its expansion through the 19th century. Um, it was becoming more profitable uh, than ever and uh, a million African Americans were moved from the Eastern Seaboard to the Deep South to, to go into cotton plantations. So yes, the, the, the ideals of the Declaration of Independence um, were part of the anti-slavery movements at the time, but there was not a sort of precipitous decline that the, that the Declaration uh, instituted in the United States. Okay. Well, could I add something to that? But there was the first emancipation, as it's sometimes called. That is, in, the in 1776, slavery was legal in every colony, all 13 colonies. Um, and then began a wave of emancipation within the northern states. So Vermont in 1777, followed by Massachusetts, followed by New Hampshire, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. All these states adopted some scheme or another of emancipation. In the case of Massachusetts, immediate, uh, a, a pretty immediate uh, scheme by the, decreed by the court in Massachusetts. The rest were acts of legislatures. Um, by, you know, by the first decade of the 19th century, half the country was free. Slavery was no longer, um, it may have been legal because it was being grandfathered, but it was on the course 
of ultimate extinction in half of the Union. That's a major accomplishment. And, and that, I think, has something to do with the liberal principles of the revolution and of the Declaration uh, of Independence. And of course, the international slave trade was being restricted by each state uh, until the Union as a whole tackled it uh, in 1808, which was the first year that the Constitution allowed it to abolish or outlaw the international slave trade. And it did it the, the first day that it was able to constitutionally do so. So this, I, these are not, these are not, uh, not nothing. I mean, these are, in, these are major changes in American politics, which had something to do with the spirit of the, of the revolution, I think. Well, those states were, did have the smallest enslaved populations in the country. Um, there, was still, there were still enslaved people in New England into the 1840s because of gradual emancipation as opposed to immediate emancipation. And the United States didn't need to import Africans in 1808. The, the population in the United States was reproducing naturally. And so uh, Virginia tried to abolish its own slave trade in 1774 because there was no need for it. The population in that state was self-reproducing. So um, some of this is, is I, I'm not, I don't want to sound like a really horrible, everything sucks and America is a terrible person. That's not how I feel. But there's a material reality to some of these issues that go beyond simple ideological notions of freedom. There's a, a, a bottom line in some cases that perhaps explains some of this in, in a stronger way. Yeah, and I think it's also important to uh, recognize that in the North, slavery was almost practiced at a distance, if I could say, that, say it that way, where uh, some of the wealthiest people f uh, who profited from slavery um, they had uh, plantations in the Caribbean. So while they didn't necessarily have uh, slavery en mass in the North, they did have plantations that they ran uh, and profited from economically as well, too, so. No, no, that's all true. And it's also true that many people in the North, or some people at least, sold their slaves to others in the South so that they wouldn't have to emancipate them. Uh, as the law would eventually call for it. That's true too. But it, it, all of that, it seems to me, doesn't really detract from the uh, massive fact that half the country which had been, pro, uh, had contained slaves, even if not as many as in the South, had abolished the institution and had declared it to be essentially illegal because immoral going forward. And that, uh, that's, um, um, I think, uh, notable. All right. Well, I think, uh, someone should confirm this for me, but I think that uh, we've reached the point where we get to eat. And uh, so thank you for your attention thus far. Enjoy your meal. And then we will return at uh, 7.30 for uh, Q&A. So enjoy your conversation. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here once again and thank you for joining us for this unconventional way of doing Ath Talks. Now we'll be moving into the Q&A section of tonight's program. So we have two microphones here um, and we'll switch between the two and introduce yourself before you state your question, say your name, your year, and try to keep it one question because I'm sure we'll have a lot. Thank you. Thank you to all of you guys for uh, coming to speak with us today. Um, my name is Giovanni Pierre. I am a sophomore here and a PPE major. Um, so my, my question is for Professor Kessler. So when you had mentioned your four possible interpretations of the first line of the declaration, um, I, I, I thought that a more apt one would be, a fifth one being that they did intend it to mean all men being self-evident, but then their definition of men being restrictive, in the sense that since it was economically beneficial to not view uh, non-white men as people, or to view black people as people, um, they just were automatically inherently excluded from that line. Um, in the sense that, you know, we see this mental gymnastics all the time with a cognitive, cognitive dissonance with, you know, phrenology or 
uh, blackness being inherited by the mother so that it's economically beneficial for a slave owner to enslave his own children. But regardless of what they intended with that line or with the entirety of the declaration, I think the beauty of the 1619 Project and in its imperfections um, is that it shows that with historical interpretation, statutory interpretation, really anything that involves people, it can't be taken at face value. Um, and so that's why I kind of contest your initial claim being that the 1619 Project views the founding of the country through a one-sided lens because I think the whole point of the project is to avoid that problem in the first place, or at least try to remedy it. So I wanted to see what your response to that would be. Thank you. <clears throat> That's a good question, but complicated. Um, well, <clears throat> on the, on the, so you ask a question really about the Declaration and then also about, about 1619. Yes. So let me take the Declaration first. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, missing paragraph in the Declaration of Independence that uh, uh, Jefferson had in his original draft, which made it to the Congress, but the Congress uh, took out in their editorial revisions. And in, this is the paragraph which condemns the King of Great Britain for not using his veto to stop the international slave trade and stop the apprehension of um, uh, of, of black people in Africa and bringing them to the United States, as a few colonies had asked him to do, uh, but he refused to use his veto for that purpose. But in the in the in the in the process of that argument, he objects to the uh, inhumanity of slavery and to and to making a market for in which men are bought and sold. Men, capital M-E-N, are bought and sold. Um, now since uh, men means black men in this case, and indeed black women and black children as well, he's using men as a synecdoche, you know. Uh, it's not just male males that are being bought and sold on a market. Um, that's a pretty clear piece of evidence that Jefferson thinks that a market in human beings is something, whatever their color, is something that is immoral and, uh, and um, ought to be illegal. Uh, so there's that piece of textual evidence. Now it's true, it didn't make it into the Declaration of Independence, but the, the guy who wrote the famous paragraph that we've been talking about, all men are created equal and so forth, also wrote this paragraph. and, and like most uh, um, authors, was very upset that his work was defaced <laughs> and a paragraph was taken out of it. You know, he, w he didn't like that. But as for the 1619 Project, um, I would say that it's, it, it, um, um, it's coy. You know, it wants to make historical claims, very sweeping ones, and then deny that it's making historical claims. It's just journalism, calling attention to different points of view which ought to inform our you know, education on this. Uh, and it's, but it, it, it is persistent, I will give it that. I mean, it, it continues to produce curriculum materials. It it's, make, it's made a film or some kind of documentary now which I haven't had a chance to see yet. Um, it's, it's sort of going Hollywood, um, and, and, uh, and so I take it maybe um, uh, more seriously than some people do, but I will, say, I will say this, there's something I like about it, uh, about the 1619 Project, which is um, it begins and ends on a pat frankly patriotic note. You know, it begins with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones saying, my father, used to, on his, uh, in his segregated uh, town in Iowa, he had a little house, he would fly the American flag every day. He was a military veteran. And she, as a young Nicole Hannah Jones, or whatever her name was at that point, um, always thought that was weird and regarded him as a patsy, as a sellout, a guy who didn't realize that he had been a victim of the system. Uh, and, and here he was celebrating the system by waving its flag every day uh, in their front yard on their flagpole. 
but in the end, in the, in the end though, she says, um, she realizes now that he was right and she as a young woman was wrong in disdaining what he was doing because there's a real sense, and this is part of the argument of the, of the essay, which I, I do admire, uh, that blacks in a sense, having been deprived of liberty for so long and yet still believing in the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, have in a sense become the most pro-American citizens of all who, despite be being deprived of rights, have, have always believed in them and ha still believe in them uh, and, and, and celebrate the country that was, was so you know, parsimonious in extending those rights to black Americans. Hi, thanks for um, being here. My name is Simran. I'm a junior studying economics, and my question is on a topic that wasn't directly discussed in the panel, but it's related to the 1619 Project, I believe. So I'm wondering what anyone on the panel thinks about um, reparations for black Americans, given that there are a lot of means-tested government programs that um, assist many black Americans already in Um, well, I think that the I would probably sort of support Ta-Nehisi Coates' 2014 article about this, which is to say that at the very least we should start to study this to understand like what could happen with reparations, what might be the sort of national outcome, and and we've only just started to scratch the surface on that, and um, I think that that's probably the first step forward. Um, but I think there's a compelling case to say that um, African Americans put so much into this country and have had so much taken, not just through slavery, but through Jim Crow, through housing discrimination, uh, that I think it's worthwhile to consider it um, as, a, as a one step towards addressing the, the challenges our country faces. Um, I was gonna say, just to tie the two ideas together, I think uh, my reading of Nicole Hannah-Jones's appreciation at the end for her uh, father's patriotism was more than a belief in the ideals and values. You know, she came to realize that he, like many others, gave their lives, right? So gave their blood, sweat, and tears to this country. So they have a, a claim to this land uh, in many ways, and so it was more than just a belief. And to tie in that idea with your ideas of reparation, I think, um, as was mentioned, uh, you know, there are many examples of um, attempts to rectify or to uh, 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 engage in redemptive actions uh, we see that with uh, uh, Japanese who were interned, right? The U.S. government paid uh, reparations to uh, those individuals and their descendant ancestors. Uh, we see uh, reparations, uh, at least attempts being made to um, address and rectify issues regarding uh, Native Americans. We see that with uh, Jewish Holocaust survivors, right? And uh, a world consensus that this, these are good things to try and address and rectify these issues. And unfortunately, we don't see that or consensus uh, around reparations for people of African descent within this country or globally as a whole. And I think that's unfortunate. Do you think that's just because there are a lot more like black people than like Native Americans or is it just people don't want to give it to them for other reasons. Could you clarify, I'm sorry. Like there are a lot more black people in the US than Native Americans, so it would be a lot more costly to give them reparations compared to Native Americans, and then you can say you're helping Native Americans and it's a lot cheaper. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily a economic um, concern. I think there's just a lack of incentive uh, given the 
difficulty of people of African descent to claim humanity right and claim um, citizenship rights uh, that are respected and recognized within the U.S. and globally as well. So I think there's just a lack of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Lack of moral imperative to address those concerns. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Taylor. I'm a first year here at CMC. I just wanted to say thank you all for a very entertaining and uh, insightful panel. I appreciate it very much. Um, I wanted to ask a question to all three of you. I was very curious um, to what your answers might be. Yesterday in class, um, the, the, I, the question came up on like which came first, racism or slavery? Um, and I wanted to see what you all thought the answer to that question might be and why. Well, <clears throat> slavery, you know, is an ancient institution. It has existed for thousands of years. Um, and in most cases, in many cases, the enslaved were of the same race as the enslaver. Uh, and so, w as Americans, because of the peculiar horrors and nature of, of our slavery, when we think slavery, we think race. Um, but in many cases, that's, that isn't uh, relevant. So I would say, in at least some sense, slavery came first uh, internationally. Um, and you can, I mean, there's a lot more s sort of philosophical reflection on slavery than there is on race. Race is, in a way, a, a relatively new question um, and not as well understood, I would say, as the as the abstract question of slavery versus uh, freedom. And it's, while it's hard to say in the actual American case, there is some evidence um, suggesting that, the, uh, and on, on this, Han Nicole Hannah-Jones is, I think, broadly correct, that it is really after the introduction of slavery that you, you get a developed um, doctrine of of racial inferiority in the country. That's a later development. So I think I in the American case, I think it's also true probably, slavery came first and then racism to justify it. But the reason that we needed a justification for it was, I think, the, as I say, the liberal spirit of the Declaration of Independence. There was, we, we felt guilty. Some of us at least felt guilty. <clears throat> but even in the South, uh, I think they felt they needed an argument to counter the egalitarianism of the American founding, broadly speaking. And that's why they developed various kinds of racial, religious, uh, well, uh, scientific, pseudo-scientific and religious arguments about inferiority. I might go into lecture mode here. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, d is David, you said? Yes. It's a huge question. It's a great question, and it's one that historians still really wrestle with. But maybe I'll go into my lecture mode and get more people up to the mics and have more questions. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty about this. One can really argue that race is a product of the transatlantic slave trade, that the idea of race doesn't really exist in the way that we think about it in societies before that. But there's something so pronounced about those divisions between who's enslaving and who's enslaved that you get this kind of modern conception of race that didn't really exist before that. Now there's, uh, so here's a couple of pieces of reading for you all if you're interested. There's a great uh, book called White Over Black by Winthrop Jordan, and Winthrop Jordan claimed that if you look at uh, kind of European texts long before the slave trade uh, to, to the Americas started, that Europeans were displaying a kind of anti-black prejudice, an anti-African prejudice, but even just literally the color black, they they disliked, <laughs> right? And that this forms a kind of prejudicial attitude that predated slavery. Now, there's a lot of evidence, though, if you look in the Americas, that um, the, the sort of first servants in, say, Virginia, uh, there's not much difference in how they're treated between white indentured servants and Africans who are being sold. And they're sometimes sold not with lifelong uh, 
contracts of servitude. They're sold with like temporary um, periods of servitude. So if that's the case, then it's not necessarily that race is as dev divisive of a factor in those very early years of colonization and in the plantation society. But what happens, here's another book that you might want to put on your shelves, is uh, Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom. And he says that you start to see the laws become more and more prejudicial towards people of African descent who are in this, this status of servitude in the 1650s and the 1660s, in part because you see fewer indentured servants coming over. Uh, the economy is getting better in Britain, so fewer people are indenting themselves. The African slave trade is ramping up, so there's more Africans who are now coming to the Americas. And then probably some of you might have heard about this in the last few years, but there's a really important uh, event called Bacon's Rebellion in 1775 and 1776 of sort of poor whites rising up in rebellion in Jamestown against rich whites because they're not, basically they're, rich whites are not letting poor whites invade Indian territory and taking their land indiscriminately. So they, they rise up against them. And Edmund Morgan argues that uh, this is kind of a turning point in which ruling whites say, what's the best way we can tamp down on this class divide within white society? Well, we'll increase the amount of stress on uh, people of African descent so that poor whites will at least feel they're more advanced than enslaved Africans. And so this is one of the theories on how kind of issues of, of racism really become pronounced, at least in the American colonies. So, lecture over. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Hard to get it out of my system. Uh, I'll just add one more uh, book to the list that, <laughs> that's all right. So, Christian Slavery, um, and I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but she talks about this idea that the concept of whiteness um, really emerges out of the Atlantic slave trade in the Bahamas, right? Where, uh, at first, it was definitely, you know, Africans were enslaved or supposed to be slaves, and then they were Christians. And then as Africans recognize that within European society and Christian beliefs, you know, uh, Christians can't enslave each other, right? And they latch onto that idea and they start converting, and quickly uh, it was changed to, well, it's not just Christian, Right, it has to do with our whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this evolution that I think has been alluded to that the Atlantic slave trade motivates, right? To ensure um, the enslavement of people of African descent. Thank you all very much. Hi, my name is Arlo, I'm a freshman at CMC. And I wanted to reference something that Professor Livese brought up earlier, which was to what extent do you think the Revolutionary was, War was fought over slavery? Um, you know, was it in protection of slavery? Was it kind of only able to happen because of slavery? Or was it really just about political freedom? So. I guess I brought it up, so I have to answer that. Um, <laughs> thanks, Arlo. Arlo's a really stellar student in my FHS right now, so <laughs> glad he's asking these great questions. Um, a little extra check mark next to your grade. <laughs> um, so I I'll try to synthesize what, what is sort of the rationale behind this. Let me say that historians don't like to use kind of monocausal explanations for anything, right? Especially something like a, a revolution. There's so many factors that go into it. So in my opinion, is slavery the thing that's trying to be protected? Is that the major issue? No, there's so many different reasons why people are joining the, the revolution and the patriotic cause. The, the argument in support, though, that there is a faction of people, a not unsubstantial faction of people, who, uh, who want to see slavery protected and are fearful about the British, there's a couple of key points to talk about. So one is that four years before the Declaration of Independence, there's a very famous court case in England called Somerset versus Stewart. And this is a case of a man named Charles Stewart who takes an enslaved man that he uh, claims ownership over named uh, James Somerset. They go to England, Stuart's there to conduct some business. While he's there, Somerset runs off, joins a very large free black community that's living in London at the time. Stuart is horrified by this. He gets uh, Somerset arrested. Somerset goes before the court and, and Stuart says, I'm gonna sell him off to Jamaica as punishment for what he did. Well, by this point, Somerset's made a lot of friends within the, the free black community in London and they get a lawyer for him, a man named Granville Sharp, to represent him. And they basically appeal to the highest court in England and say, um, 
he should have habeas corpus rights because this is, he's in England and this is, these are the rights of England. England has no laws about slavery. All the laws on slavery were uh, uh, crafted in American assemblies. So Lord, Sam or Lord Mansfield, who is the judge, the, the head judge in this case, who happens to have a mixed race grandniece living with him in his London home, who is a child of an enslaved woman, decides that he does have habeas corpus rights. This is a very limited decision, but it creates this sense that England has just abolished slavery. It's not true, England has not abolished slavery. But throughout the American colonies, there becomes a deep concern that England is on the, the path, perhaps, of undercutting the legal justifications for slavery. This is just four years before the revolution. We talked about this at the head table, too. The year before the Declaration of Independence, um, as patriots are starting to take up arms, um, one of the strategies that's employed by Lord Dunmore, who's the governor of Virginia, is to offer freedom to any enslaved person who's on a plantation of a rebel plantation owner. If they run away from their plantation and join the British Army, they'll be given freedom. You can imagine how that went over for southern planters to have enslaved people on their plantations running away to join the British. And this becomes a huge issue where people throughout the Americas, because the newspapers report on this, not just in the South, but also in the North, uh, are, are saying, uh, not that England is anti-slavery, but England will do whatever it has to do, or whatever it wants to do, to try to exert control over us. Because England was not anti-slavery at this point. There was still slavery for another almost 60 years in that empire. But there was a sense that slavery was just one little political pawn that the English could mess with in order to try to exert their will on, on the Americans. And so that's why, for a, a faction at least of, of people in, in uh, continental North America, um, they did see a potential threat to slavery. And that's why Jefferson included this, this note about fear of domestic insurrections as being one of the faults of the king uh, and why they need to separate from him. So those are sort of the reasons why. Again, in my opinion, that is not the dominant reason why the re revolution occurred, but it, I think it absolutely was a factor that played into to some defenses of it. We? Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, we would very much appreciate it if you could take just a minute and uh, fill out a, a quick survey about this event to help provide some feedback. There's a QR code. Uh, you can take your phone out and, um, and, and get it. Uh, and uh, it's just four questions, very simple, very easy, but it helps us a lot to know whether we were on the right track with this uh, event. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, I would just, I haven't said very much, but I, I would say I would agree with Dan that this was very, very low on the list. In fact, uh, I, I would probably go farther than Dan because I, I think the, the issue about the Somerset was very murky. Uh, the issue with the, uh, with the uh, insurrection didn't start until after the war had begun, right? So uh, the idea that the colonists were re rebelling because of the slave insurrections that were not fomented by the British until after the war began is not the one that makes a lot of, of sense to me. And I think, um, you know, there were, there were th hundreds, probably thousands of pamphlets, uh, revolutionary pamphlets of one sort or another. That was kind of the main means by which people communicated. I'm not sure if there were any, maybe Dan can speak to this, but I'm not aware of one out of all of those that referred to the slavery issue as the reason to uh, revolt. And finally, you know, I don't, uh, I just have a hard time seeing that as a major cause for the revolution when as soon as the revolution was over, and in fact even before it was over, more than half of the colonies abolished slavery. So uh, I think it's uh, maybe for a couple of people out there, I, I would always hesitate to say that there was no one who was motivated by this, but I, I don't think it was a very uh, high motivation person. Hi, my name is Evan. I'm a freshman at CMC. Uh, so my question concerns Bacon's rebellion. In uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, she argues that Bacon's rebellion created a pattern 
where the capitalist elites turn poor black people and poor white people against each other to avoid social change. It happened again with the collapse of the populist party and it happened again with the creation of mass incarceration. So my question is, to what extent do all of you agree with Michelle Alexander's argument? Could you reframe or rephrase the question again? Just make sure that I understand it. Yeah, so uh, I, I'll talk about how like uh, Reagan used like tough on crime rhetoric in the 1980s to turn poor black people and turn and poor white people against each other. So Reagan used uh, technically colorblind language that had racially charged undertones like the super predator myth or the uh, welfare queen myth as a way to discredit populist movements and claim that black people just wanted handouts when in reality the movement was about changing a social system that overwhelmingly benefited the white capitalist elites. So I'm wondering like to what extent is it true that the, like, that the capitalist class uses uh, racism to uh, maintain its power and control? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a relevant question and I think a valid one as well because uh, I think we can look throughout history and see how, I think was, uh, Dan already mentioned this as well, that, you know, oftentimes um, uh, poor rights uh, occupy the same space um, uh, economically or socially as um, people of African descent, but oftentimes they're motivated to engage in practices and or support policies that are um, not within their interests, so to speak, with the idea that you know they have a, a protected status as a white citizen of uh, the United States. And so, uh, in short, I would agree with, uh, uh, what's her name, Alexander? M Michelle Alex Michelle Al Alexander. I'll just answer quickly, which is that I think, I, I tend to, to agree that there is something that's happening in Virginia around this time. Bacon's Rebellion is kind of the end part of that process. It had begun before Bacon's Rebellion, but I think that you can really see a sort of significant change in how race is talked about or, or being a factor in the way that we kind of think about it in the modern sense. And so because of the ways in which race and incarceration um, are, are such a factor in American society today, I think it's important to kind of have that historical context. I don't think there's a straight line between those two. I think the history of, of mass incarceration is a very, very complicated history. But I think some of the racial antecedents that you're referring to certainly can be traced back to that. Great, thank you. I would say, um, sorry, <laughs> you can sit down. Uh, <laughs> um, there's also the prior question, which is whether the South the, sla the slaveocratic South was capitalist or not. This is a major question in economic history. I mean, its ethos is not capitalist. Its ethos is seigneurial, aristocratic. It, it, uh, various words have been applied to it. And as we get closer to the Civil War and the debates between North and South intensify, you will see George Fitzhugh and other apologists of the South claiming that um, affinities between, so between slavery and socialism and arguing that you know, the wage laborer in the North is in a much worse position than the slave in the South is, whose welfare, whose food, whose uh, uh, medical bills are all taken care of by, the, um, um, uh, by his owner who has an interest in his total health and his total well-being so he can produce more for the owner. Uh, and whereas capitalist labor in the North is abandoned, very Marxist kind of argument, is abandoned and, uh, and uh, they are the ultimate victims, much worse off than slaves. So anyway, that's, uh, that the assumption that what slavery was was capitalism is itself, I think, one that has to be defended. Thank you.
Thank you all for your amazing questions and thank you again to our professors for being here with us and now please join me in uh, thanking them again. Thank you.